Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Julia. I was an admission officer at Haverford College, an outside reader for Emory University, and I currently work as a school-based counselor at a school in Massachusetts. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a wellness coach at the Kenan Flagler Business School at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And I'm so blessed to be able to work alongside both my beautiful daughters at School Match for You, a college counseling firm that I founded in 2010. Good morning, friends. I'm very happy today. First of all, the two teeth I had pulled have almost healed. I still look like a chipmunk, but I was told by the doc be a couch potato for three full days. And I was chomping at the bit to get out and work on beautifying the grounds around our house. So today's day five, and yesterday I resumed that. And it just felt so good just to be outside, be moving around, beautiful weather, nature. That's my feel-good space. I was just starting to feel so sluggish, becoming so sedentary. But I did something that's going to shock you. I watched two movies. I watched a movie called The Client with Susan. I'm going to butcher her name. and You guys are going to laugh at me. Sarandon? Sarandon? Susan Sarandon? Sarandon? And Tommy Lee Jones. I got that one right. And Shawshank Redemption with Morgan Friedman. Now, you guys don't know this about me, but I'm a total, total violence wimp. That's one reason I actually don't like to watch a lot of movies. So I turned my head at these shootings that came on. And uh, you guys know I'm also a language whip. In fact, when I was at Michigan State, I remember my freshman year, I remember this guy from Detroit. He's like, you've got virgin ears. Because he could tell I didn't like swearing and profanity. So I tolerated the foul language. but. They say variety is the spice of life. So despite the violence and the foul language, they were they were good movies. And that was all good. But I'm glad to be back on my feet. And I'm getting ready to take off for South Carolina. Yes, I'm hitting the road for a week to do college visits. I'll visit College of Charleston, University of South Carolina, Columbia, and Augusta University in Augusta, Georgia. But it's a working vacation. So I'll be staying um, at a Disto Beach, about 45 minutes from Charleston. Uh, and take off Tuesday morning. But before I take off, a family I work with from Hawaii is flying in tonight to Atlanta. I'm excited to meet them for dinner. So I'm in a super great mood and thrilled about meeting them. Now, one of the best things about living in Atlanta is, you know, we have these 11 institutions that draw students from all over the country. Now, there's a lot more than 11 institutions here. But I get to meet a lot of clients and podcast listeners that come to Atlanta to visit there's about 11 that I would say draw nationally, um, and I'm talking about Georgia Tech, Emory, really the whole AUC, Atlanta University Center, but mostly Spelman and Morehouse. Then you've got the University of Georgia, you've got Mercer and Macon, SCAD, there's both a Savannah and an Atlanta location for SCAD, you know, Savannah College of Art and Design. Uh, they've really been branding themselves as SCAD. And then Oglethorpe right here in Atlanta, Agnes Scott uh, right here, and Georgia State and Clark Atlanta. You know, like I said, there's other colleges and universities, but they're more regional. Keep an eye on Kennesaw State. They have a strong engineering program and a strong nursing program and many other strong programs coupled with D1 sports that are on the rise. And that could really give them national pull in the next 10 years. And then you have Augusta University, where I'll be at on the 18th of the month for a visit. They're a health and life science power, and they're an R1 university. So they continue to expand their outreach. And then we have Barry College, a small, very conservative college in Rome, Georgia, that is uh, the next school I could see moving from more of a regional to more of a national pull in the next decade. Uh, and Barry has something no other school in the country has, but you're going to have to wait and listen to our next big number to find out what that distinction is that Barry has. So I just feel blessed to live here. 
Uh, but before we dive into today's episode, I do have a few announcements. Our next webinar is on the 16th of July, and it's up on our website. And it's your chance to ask your questions about how colleges evaluate homeschool applicants. So we'll have all three of the guests that I interviewed, Dr. Michelle Evard, Holly Ramsey, the two college counselors who lead the IECA group for homeschool applicants, and Liam Daly, the homeschooled admissions liaison for Beloit College. The sign-up sheet is up. So just go to your collegeboundkid.com slash events to sign up and spread the word to both your homeschooling communities or anyone who's just curious about how college admissions works and you want to know more about how our homeschooled applicants, which you know can be a unique uh, way in which that's evaluated by an admission office. So come ask your questions and listen and learn. Now, if you're a planner and you want to know, well, what's up next? What's up after the homeschooling webinar? What's up next is Matthew Carpenter, the founder of College Aid Pro. He'll be doing a webinar for us on August 6th. Uh, in order to make it easier for you, we're doing all of our webinars at the same time. So 8.30 Eastern, 7.30 Central, 6.30 Mountain, 5.30 Pacific. Um, if you have any questions about paying for college, you want to block that out on your calendar, uh, that should go up on our events page by next Monday. It should be up. Um, so good six, seven weeks in advance. But I want to get it on your calendar. And if you're thinking, well, how do you know if this Matt Carpenter guy's any good? Well, first of all, I just completed a four-part interview with Matt this week, and I was very pleased with it. So you'll be hearing that. We broke it down into two two-part episodes. So we did the deepest dive we've done on college student loans. You know, we talked about the federal direct lo student loan, the Parent PLUS loan. We talked about state loans, and we talked about private loans. And we really get into loans, and that's going to air on June 27th and on July 4th. And then I also did a two-part interview on College Aid Pro, a tremendous company that Matt founded. And the company I founded, School Match for You, we partnered with them because we're really excited about the work Matt and his team are doing. But I wanted to bring to our podcast listeners all the things that they're doing to help students and their services um, and that's going to air on the 11th of July and the 18th of July. Uh, so you will have had a chance to hear Matt for four weeks, and then you can put 8-6 on your calendar, block it off, come bring any questions you have about paying for college. He's a pro. He can answer them. Remember, if you have any questions about the honor section of the Common App, you have until June 15th to send them. Just go to speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK, and we can answer them on the 18th of June when Hillary, Susan, Julia, and Vince and I do our second roundtable. So we'll be taking the questions you send in on the honor section on the Common App. All right, let's get back to today's episode. So I had planned on discussing another missed opportunity that I see causes a lot of problems in the college admissions process. I prepared all my notes and everything uh, for that. Uh, but that's going to have to get pushed back another week. And I'll cover that next week for you guys because, you know, we always have to be open to news breaking. And some news really broke this week. Stanford, I, you know, I think it's a straw that broke the camel's back. Julie and I just had to discuss their decision to go back to requiring test scores. And we just have a candid conversation about what students and parents should do, about why this is disturbing to us, and it's been six months since you've heard a grinding my gears from me, so get ready for a grinding my gears. Julie and I get spicy, but that comes after Julie and I discuss scholarship displacement. It's actually a recording we did back in April. Mariah sent in a great question, and I'll just be completely candid with you. It's never happened to me before. I couldn't find the answer. So I, I, I spent two hours searching for this thing, and that's never going to happen to me again, though. I've got a new labeling system, so I label questions differently, so I don't have to go through a whole hour and a half recording to find it anymore. Uh, but Julie and I will be talking about scholarship displacement. And then my friend of 23 years, John Hoffman, who, along with Susan, have been the two people I've talked the most about college admissions in the last 20, 25 years. Um, uh, Julia, I'd throw her in there if we include the last eight years. Uh, so we all burn up the phones and talk shop all the time. And I just wanted you to hear some of his wisdom. So you'll be hearing part three of his own experience, his journey in the world of placement. Also reflects a little bit on his kids. He talks a little bit about the core curriculums because John's a huge advocate of 
the core curriculum. So we talk a little bit about that. And so that'll be the final part. But let's transition now to Julie and I talking about scholarship displacement. And now it's time for a question from one of our listeners. Friends, I finally found the answer. Julie and I record it in April on scholarship displacement. So I'm going to play the question from Maria, and then we have some discussion. Julia's with me, but she's asked me to take the lead on this one. So let's play Maria's question. Hi, Mark and crew. Uh, my name is Maria, and I have been listening for uh, the past several months now, and your resource has been tremendously helpful. So I appreciate everything that you're doing. Uh, recently, I came across another podcast, Get Schooled, and they brought up the topic of scholarship displacement and was mortified to learn about this practice. Uh, I did a little bit of research on my own and realized I live in Pennsylvania, which is a state, fortunately, that passed legislation to ban scholarship displacement in our state. Uh, I wanted to do a little more research and just make sure that that applies across the board. Um, however, it did give me some concern for people who do not live in a state um, that has banned this practice. So I was hoping maybe you can talk a little bit more about scholarship displacement and uh, what people should be looking out for. So th again, thank you so much for your help. Greatly appreciate it as a parent. So Maria, I love this question because I have a feeling a lot of people don't know what scholarship displacement is, and that gives me an opportunity to teach, which always makes me really happy. So the way scholarship displacement works is you got a particular aid award from a college. Let's just say they were going to give you 30000 And then they ask you to report any outside scholarship that you received. And let's say your student got a Lions Club $3,000 scholarship. And then you find out that they reduce their award. And now everybody's frustrated because your student is like, why did I work so hard? The scholarship committee, scholarship committees and they hate displacement, you know, because they want to feel like they're helping a kid get ahead, not just reducing the amount of aid that the school gives. So first of all, let me go into the, the rationale behind it. And this is, I've heard many, many a financial aid officer put it this way. They'll say to a family, or maybe they're talking to a group of college counselors, and they'll say, if somebody, let's say we were going to give somebody $40,000 and their family won the lottery, do you think that they should get the money anymore? Most people are like, no. Then they'll say, okay, so you agree on the principle that if there is more resources available, then we should reduce our aid award. So now we're just talking about amounts. So that's the, that's the concept that we gave you an award thinking you had X resources and now we found out you have more. There's other people that are needier. So that's sort of the rationale behind it. Now, it's so frustrating because it's a big, incredibly disincentive for any student to apply, for scholarship committees to award, you know, money. And so it has been outlawed. Um, I think it's up to seven states. Maryland was the first one to outlaw it. We did a podcast on that in like 2018. California, a bunch of states have legislation through to outlaw it and make it illegal. Um, so they're literally passing legislation state by state, and there's a whole lobbying committee out there to do it. Now, here's the thing that you should be aware of, though, with scholarship displacement. This is one thing that I think people misunderstand is most of the time it doesn't come into play, even for schools that do scholarship displacement. And here's the reason why. Got to get into the weeds a little bit here. So for one, most schools gap students. Gap means that they're, uh, it's best to use an example. So let's say a school costs $50,000 and let's say you can afford, not by your own analysis, but by either the CSS profile, a school's institutional forms or the FAFSA, they feel that does an assessment of the income and assets of the students and the parents. They feel you can afford 25. So if you can afford 25 and the school costs 50, so you now have a need of 25. 25, 50 minus 25 equals 25, right? You can afford 25, the school costs 50, you have a need of 25. 
Gapping means the school asks you to pay more than 25. They ask you to pay 35. So now they gapped you by 10,000 because they never met your need. And when you hear schools brag about we meet full demonstrated need, it means, no, you qualify for 25, you're getting 25. Now, that's a combination of, of, of self-help, you know, loans, you know, not any old loans, federal direct loans, which is capped at a certain amount, 5,500 freshman year, 6,500 sophomore year, 7,500 junior and senior year, oftentimes a campus job or off-campus nonprofit known as work study and need and or merit-based aid. So it's all kind, all three of those things are part of financial aid, scholarships and grants, loans, work study, right? So most of the time, most schools gap, more than 95% of schools gap, not because they want to, because it just takes an incredible amount of resources to run a school. So most schools gap, that's the first thing to point out. And the reason why that's important is most of the time when schools do scholarship displacement, they don't do it if there's a gap. So if you went out and got 10,000 and they gapped you by 10,000, most of the time they would allow that to apply to a gap. Secondly, most of the time, they also allow it to be applied to the self-help component. So what's the self-help? It's that, it's that federal direct student loan, 5,500. Let's say you got 3,500 in work study. That's 9,000 of what's called self-help, which is different than gift aid. Grants and scholarship gift aid, loans, and, and uh, work study self-help. Most of the time, they will, they will allow the outside scholarship to also apply to the self-help. So let's say someone was gapped by 10,000 and then had another 9,000 in self-help, that's 19,000. Most of the time, any scholarship money that comes in would go first toward that 19,000. And it would only, scholarship displacement would only come into place if all of that money was exhausted. That's the only time it comes into play. And I bring that up because, you know, one thing I used to do a lot of, which I really haven't done in a while, I used to like to ask financial aid directors, what percentage of your students come in with an outside scholarship? I'm not talking about institutional money. I'm not talking about federal money. I'm not talking about state money. I'm talking about civic organizations, corporations, foundations, philanthropists, churches, places of worship. So I'm going to ask you to guess what percentage, what would you say is the most frequent percentage I would hear? Two questions. When I would ask financial aid directors, what percentage of people come in with outside scholarship money? What do you think I would hear most often, Julia? Uh, I don't know. 50%? No. One in eight to one in 10. Oh, wow. Yep. I would have thought way more than that. No. One in eight to one in 10. And then next question, what's the average amount they see of people coming in with outside you know, scholarship money? Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want to be negative. If you really know how to do this and you're willing to put the time in and have a plan, like you can do really, really well. But very few people either know how to do it or have the discipline to implement a plan. And it's also a lot harder, by the way, if you don't have a financial need, because a lot of the outside scholarships are designed, they are targeting people with a high financial need. Just this week, I identified an expert. I want to come on here and teach you how to win outside scholarships. And we've had outreach to that expert. And they haven't accepted yet, but if they don't, I have a fantastic backup person as well. We did one interview with Kristen Mosley about four years ago. You can listen to that where she talked about 10 outside scholarships she won. Just go to yourcollegeboundkid.com and put in Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-E-N in the search bar. It'll pull up. Uh, but I also want to bring uh, a scholarship expert to you. I haven't done that yet, so look for that in the future. So what, what do you think is the average amount I would hear, Julia, that a, a student would come in with? Less than 10000 Between twenty five and 3500 What? Oh, yeah. There we go. Okay. Yeah. And most of the time, it's one year not renewable also. Right. Yes. That's what I was going to ask next. Yeah. <laughs> so if you take these 1 in 8 to 1 in 10, getting twenty five to 3500 most schools are either gapping more than that or they're providing more self-help than that. So most of the time, displacement only comes into place if somebody is either a school that meets full need and doesn't gap. Right. Or um, you get a huge award. Now, there are some exceptions to this, but most of the time when you look at displacement, 
it really doesn't apply to gapping or to the self-help portion of the eight award. Now you want to know something that's so bad. I'm going to like, my blood is going to boil when I share oh, no. this. I don't know if I can take it. It's really bad, Julia. So <laughs> you should see Julia. She's like covering her face. Like, I don't know if I can take this. <laughs> it's been a season. <laughs> So, you know, I did back from 2012 to 2014, I did this whole 10 hour, you know, <clears throat> video series called Game Change. It was like your counselor in a box. And I had about 20, 25 minutes on scholarship displacement in there. So I kind of know this stuff. And I went into shelters and I'm not getting into all that here. Like some, some schools do a 50-50 shelter, meaning the amount that's over the gap, half of it goes to reduce it, half of it goes to you. There's lots of different models out there. So I knew this stuff pretty well. Now... When Karis went to Davidson, Davidson is a school that meets full demonstrated need without any loans, and they don't even have a summer work component. They're one of the very few schools that have no summer work component. Now, Karis had gone to KIPP her last year, her eighth grade. We moved from Pennsylvania to Atlanta. She attended the school that I was working at for one year, and KIPP had scholarships for students, so she was eligible for the scholarship. So she got this $1,500 scholarship, went to Davidson, and Kip sent the money straight to Davidson, and therefore they reduced her award. Yeah, yes. So this happened to me, and I knew about this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and, and But as soon as I found out they sent it, I mean, I got them to change it the next year because part of the award involved... You had to do service for 50, for, it was pretty good. For every one hour of service, you got a hundred bucks. So if you got 2000 award, $2,000 award, you had to do 20 hours of service. You got 1500, you had to do 15 hours of service. So I worked with Davidson's financial aid and with Kip to label that money as, as like more like a work study money, yeah, not as an outside scholarship. And they, so they changed their coding in their system for future years, but I got burned by this, even that I used to go around teaching this stuff and my blood still boils, even that it was only $1,500. Still mad about it. No, it's real. It's the principle of it. Yes. All. Yeah. So anything, what do you want to say about scholarship displacement? Anything, Julia? I totally agree with you. And actually, I I start with families, uh, any family that has mentioned to me that uh, affording college is a criterion. Um is that I will actually first start with a conversation about this and at the 100% demonstrated need uh, schools. Um, and then certainly it's a different conversation with my high need students, because if they are lucky enough um, to get into a Davidson that's a no loan and meets 100% demonstrated need, sometimes I let them know, we might not apply for any scholarships and we probably shouldn't actually. Um, so it's, it's good to have the conversation at the beginning because, um, I had a family say to me like this and they weren't wrong. It was sort of a, a middle income family that did come up with a little bit of need, um, uh, but then got a few outside scholarships, which just replaced that, uh, the award from the school. And that while at the end of the day, they were still paying out the same, um, I feel the family was like, why do we go through all of that work? And if it was just replacing what we had, right? So I actually do have students start with when they are list building. I actually have them, if any of them are curious about or, or looking at outside scholarships or curious about getting those, I have all of them call the financial aid office and ask them how they deal with outside scholarships. Um, cause I've even gotten different, um, answers. Like we have, I had a Questbridge student, for example, who was a Questbridge finalist. So she gets the full ride to that school, but she was also a Davis scholar, which is a special scholarship for international students where, uh, $25,000 comes to, with the student. Um, and so I was just wondering, like, does that reduce the quit? Like, how does or does she just say goodbye to that? So all of her life, she she worked really hard to get that scholarship. It helped her it, it go to Milton, but um, there was no reason for her to have that scholarship. She had everything else she needed. Um, 
So I, I do think it's, it really makes sense to ask. Um, and then, and I, I'll just shout out again to my friends at Wesleyan Financial Aid. I had so many one-off questions about this kind of stuff this year, and they were so clear with me about what, how outside scholarships are treated. They say, first it goes to this, then it goes to that. And then obviously, and I think what is helpful for families to hear, um, sort of like that lottery thing is that obviously you can't, um, you can't apply outside scholarships to more than what the college, right? Like you can't be paid, being paid. Yeah, that's really college. important. So yeah. that, so that uh, colleges can actually get in real trouble yes. if they give you more than the full cost of attendance. Like sometimes you'll hear people say, they're paying me to go to school. They're actually not. You know, when people say that, what they're referring to is that they're living off campus. And so they get a check that's, you know, based on the school's estimates of of like how much the rent and everything costs in the area. And then it's up to you to take that check to pay for your rent. But people will say that a lot. I get paid to go to school. No, they can really get in trouble if they pay you. So that's something that's important to remember. Um, it's in, you, you know, you should always start by Googling name of school outside scholarship policy. Shout out to McAllister. They have a great section on their website that many schools do that explain how it works. But I found more schools don't have elaborate written policies on scholarship displacement policy, which, by the way, they tend to be all over the place. And once again, if you don't if you don't get an answer there, like Julia said, uh, if you don't see it in writing, reach out to the financial aid office so you know what what the policy is and you can take that into consideration. But it. It doesn't come into play as much as most people think because of the fact that, one, most schools gap, most schools give a lot of self-help, and almost always, you know, almost always the outside scholarship goes toward the self-help or to the gap first. And because and that's why I had to do the guessing on that 25, 3,500. There's not yeah. a ton of people getting the 20, 30, 40 thousand outside scholarship like they're out there but they're rare right there's just not right. that many and so but those are the time now if you're looking at getting a really large outside scholarship you definitely are going to really want to know this for sure now if you find yourself concerned about scholarship displacement let me give you a few tips one build a good relationship with someone in the financial aid office this is something every student and every parent would be wise and advised to do if you're getting any kind of gift aid which is free money that doesn't have to be repaid. Or even if you're getting self-help, loans and work study. Next, if you can appeal the figures that are being used in the cost of attendance formula, go ahead and do it. Remember a few weeks ago when a listener from Texas asked us how travel is calculated? And we talked about how you have to calculate your own numbers. Well, travel, personal miscellaneous, they're not the only things that can be appealed. Sometimes you can appeal a number of things and get your cost of attendance increase. And the higher your cost of attendance is, then the outside scholarships can be applied. Remember, it's a federal violation for a college to give you more money than the actual cost. So they can't do that. But let's say you're getting a $2,000 new MacBook Pro. You could appeal and ask if that could be included in the cost of attendance. If you had an unexpected de dental or medical expense in the course of the year. You could appeal and ask if that could be included in your cost of attendance. What if uh, your mom or your dad had to take an extra trip in to see you because you were really sick? So they hopped a flight, came in, and had some travel expenses. These are all things that could fall under personal miscellaneous, and the school could increase your cost of attendance and then apply the scholarship to that. But it's also the kind of thing that really almost never happens if you don't have a good relationship with someone in financial aid. And of course, depending on the school's policy may or may not determine whether or not it's approved, but it, you know, it never hurts to ask. I'm reminded of the words my former colleague at Kip used to always say, close mouths don't get fed. She's from South Carolina or I'll be the rest of the week. Close mouths don't get fed. So speak up. Finally, you should know that there continues to be a lot of blowback against scholarship displacement, and it's growing and growing quickly. Nothing will grind the gears more of a scholarship recipient, you heard my story with Julia, or the outside scholarship granting agency, than scholarship displacement. Think about it. Imagine you're trying to raise money from a donor, and they say, why should I give money 
if the scholarship's just going to get displaced and the college is just going to take the money. And these organizations, they're in it to help kids. So they think they're, they've helped a kid and they've seen the kid work really, really hard. Then the scholarship's displaced. It's beyond aggravating. So there's a real movement afoot to make this illegal. Now, we talked about it around four years ago on the podcast. Maryland was the first state to make this illegal. And I attended a, a workshop in it's either 19, 2019 or 2020 at a conference about seven states that were about to ban scholarship displacement and make it illegal. And since then, a lot has happened. Assembly Bill 288, that's the California Ban on Scholarship Displacement Act. That got signed by Governor Gavin Newsom in September 30th, 2022. And last time I checked, six states have banned scholarship displacement. You know, so a great question. Yes. And uh, that's why our listeners are sharp. All right, Julia, some um, news that wasn't pleasing to us broke this week. Do you want to talk about Stanford's announcement and why why it was discouraging? Yeah, well, I'm, as I, I think the listeners know me well enough now <laughs> that I really just really dislike standardized testing. Um, so uh, Stanford uh, announced that they are going back to requiring uh, SAT or ACT scores for students applying, but that would be uh, uh, for uh, next year's cycle. But if you're like me and you got just really panicked right away and just assumed it was for the, it was this year's cycle and got all mad, um, but uh, well, that was you and me both because yes. they said. <laughs> <laughs> they, yes, they initially yeah. said fall of 2025, and you think class of 2025. Exactly. I got realized... super confused. Yes. yes. In fact, I had yes. to read it twice when someone, when luckily somebody in our team corrected me. Yeah, me um, too. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. <laughs> yes, thank you, Sylvia. Always having our backs. Um, and important to note, too, in that in our family, we've got a lot of California folks. And, you know, Vince brought up the point about um, it's not really it's a little bit of an issue in Massachusetts, but I wasn't aware of just how tough it's been trying to get a seat for particularly the SAT in California. Um, and as much as Stanford is a private school, the majority of their applicants uh, are or the, the the highest represented state for them is California. So um, it just really bums me out on a lot of levels. Um, and I, you know, um, uh, especially because they serve such so many of the students in the state of California, which the um, you know, unlike Massachusetts, uh, where, you know, even some struggling public high schools are still pretty decent. Um, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of vulnerable, uh, folks in there in the California and a lot of other places that this is just a bummer to me. Um, but I'm just starting to like accept the fate of, uh, all of these super uber selective, the most selective all, you know, jumping ship from the test optional <laughs> side. So I have one question for you that, about that, and then I'm going to bring back something that I haven't done in a while, six months, my grinding my gears. I'm yes. going back to a grinding my gears. But before I do that, do you feel, Julia, that your advice about testing is any different than it was before for a high achiever? Let's say you have a high achieving student that's aspiring to some highly selective universities and maybe they're not, maybe not planning on doing test prep or putting a little emphasis on that. Um, and let's say most of the schools they're thinking about right now are test optional, but they're, let's say class of 2026. Would you advise them any differently with the rash of decisions that we've seen come out? And, you know, of course, we've had Texas and we've had Dartmouth, which kicked everything off. And then we had Brown, you know, and then we had Yale that, you know, came up with something creative. But it's going to amount to pretty much the same thing, especially with all these other schools doing going there. Then we have Stanford. And then who am I forgetting? They also announced Cornell for next yes, year. Yes, yeah. Cornell for next year. Caltech, my favorite. Yes, yes, <laughs> Caltech. Now, we've had a bunch of schools reaffirm test optional, but a lot of those are one-year renewals, like the Dukes and the and the uh, Princetons, and we'll see what happens for class of 2026. So would your advice be any different? 
I think I, you know, and I can't even remember what I've been saying, but I, I think ever since it became safe again to take a standardized test, I have always encouraged students to take it um, at least once. And then for my, when in the, in the very test optional world, then from that one score or one time, then I might advise to not retake if it meant that, you know, the only time you'd want to report your score, if it's in this ridiculous range that we're nowhere close to getting. So let's stop with testing. Um, or if a student was really close to maybe having something that could help them get some merit aid, help them, um, you know, uh, maybe boost their transcript a little bit if maybe they had a couple C's on there or something. But um, now I actually, even before sort of this rash, I've been going back to like, you should probably, everyone should probably test twice. Like I, I used to, um, used to recommend, um, uh, because at this point I'm just finding a lot of places are still asking for something or, or something I ran into in the test optional world too, was some of my students who might've had, below a GPA threshold. Um, and these are like, you know, Clemson's and like large, you know, larger institutions where all of a sudden they didn't have a test because they never took one and they needed to provide one because they had a GPA that was a little below a threshold. So there's been, or my uh, service academy students, my ROTC students, my scholarship seeking students, it's just become, there's been more places I keep finding the need for a test, um, or even our recruited athletes, even if you don't need to report that test. It's so I think at this point, regardless of Dartmouth kicking off these dominoes, I had really kind of, even whether I like it or not, sort of, if you're okay testing, if you either get a fee waiver or if it's not a financial burden um, to take it, you know, twice at least. Um, but now I'm feeling like uh, not that much different because it's still, I, I, I know it feels overwhelmingly like everyone's going back to test optional, but we're still talking about a super, super small percentage of highly uber selective uber rejective schools right and and it does feel i could understand if i were an enrollment manager at maybe a school that was not as notable as a place like stanford i could understand the pressure um to maybe try to be in that field or as we've talked about in this podcast a lot um a lot of the time the testing the love of testing sometimes comes from the faculty of the college, not Definitely. necessarily admissions. And so it's going to be hard to, I would imagine it'd be hard to please your faculty if you're at a pretty selective school and you're remaining on that test optional island and then you don't really have anything um you know, to kind of back it up. I, again, uh, a lot of these schools have come out with research saying that it would be in the best interest of uh, vulnerable populations and or the school's diversity efforts to look at testing. Do you buy that? I, well, I think we... <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't. I think I think it's I think it's very possible, especially you know, I work with College Horizon students who if they are looking at a place like Dartmouth, right? Maybe they had like an eleven fifty and they thought, Oh gosh, I definitely don't want to report that. But actually that's like ninety ninth percentile for where they're from, right? And so I do believe there's probably it's not an overwhelming amount, but there's sure. probably some percentage where that is true. I just don't I, I just, I, I just don't really, yeah, I don't fully buy that argument. And um, I, and, but I will say this, the one thing that leaves me hope is that I don't think the, all these colleges like are in bed with the college board or like profitable ACT now, but, but in that it will lower the average test score. So we're not, you're not, you're not entering back into a pool where you need to be getting a 1500 or a 35 or above, right? It's, it's going to bring down the scores and they've all made. I don't know about that though, Julia. I mean, t take a look at every single school that we've listed. They're all schools that have average test scores above that, even before the pandemic. Like if True. you look at the group, if you look at the group that's returning. So I would say, though, I, I guess I'm more I, I don't think it would bring it back a huge amount, but I think a decent amount or to the point I want I want people to know, especially if they're from an underrepresented background or an under resourced background, that this does not mean that you are out of the game just because you're not scoring near a 1500. I really do think it'll that's be an like, important point. Yeah, the schools I, will still the schools will still look at a holistic lens. Yes. At look at evaluating you through the opportunities that you've had and, and that sort of thing. And so that's important. And you don't want people to just get intimidated and then not apply when they could be attractive applicants. Yes. 
Totally. Um, and even if you're not from a, I, I, you know, I, I, I think I mentioned this when we interviewed Lee, but one of the, before the test optional movement, before- Julie's referring to Lee Coffin at Dartmouth. Yes. Julie's on a first name basis with yes, Lee. Sorry. He used to work, he used to work at Milton. So he's just Lee. But for those of you who are not following, uh, Julie and I did interview Lee Coffin's VP of enrollment for a two hour interview. Um, before at that time they were taking this, test recommended stance, which was very, very bold and kind of broke that news on our podcast. Right. But then it went from test recommended to test required. So that's the, that's, that's who Lee is. If you're not following, yeah. go ahead. Yes. Thank you, Mark. And also, I, I guess I even appreciate that more now. It wasn't like the rug was like pulled from under us with that, with that soft launch. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. That was, it was a telltale. Yeah. I did have a student uh, once that um, in the regular round was a very strong student, very strong student, and came from a well-resourced background and was overrepresented in the process in a lot of different ways. And I was so thrilled when they got into Dartmouth in the regular round. And they it, it, because their test scores were actually pretty low for their demographic and for Milton. And I remember Lee saying to us, we were like, Oh gosh, amazing. This is so great. Thank you. He was like, no, we are, we, I have to be mission driven here. We're holistic. And it's like, if that was the one reason to keep an amazing student out, that's not right. And so I share that story, even though it was pre pandemic, uh, just because I do think admission officers and these colleges do do have a mission to serve all and look at all or not serve all, but really look at people holistically and with fairness and with equity um, and that they'll still be committed to that. Um, but I do, I will say um, particularly in the group of students I work with, which are well, well-resourced independent school students. I do think we are going to see, I'm going to see some different decisions. And I honestly think that serves my students who need sometimes a little bit of a reality check. I'm not saying a saying a score is at all commensurate with your potential or intellect, but when you've got great inflation um, and you've got so many applicants that as Rod Skinner used to say, really selective places are looking for reasons to deny you. Right. So um I'm not saying it'll automatically push you out, but I do think we'll, I wonder if it will help some well-resourced students find a little more clarity over some decisions that might be made or just the uber selectivity of these places. Yeah. And I think that in some ways we're not saying any, we're not saying anything any different than we did before, right? We've always said even test optional schools like high test scores. They they do. They like high test scores. They yeah. just believe that they have enough tools in the toolkit to evaluate a kid without them. And there's a lot of kids out there they feel can make their school stronger. And they don't want to have that barrier keep a great kid who they have confidence can do their program from getting admitted. So we've always been an advocate of go through a little prep. Don't make it an extracurricular activity. Don't let it dominate your life. And but it's worth putting a little time in because it can impact things. We've talked about scholarships, and there's just a lot of schools out there that still like scores. Um, but the the wisdom still stands. We've always said, if it is a test optional school, if you've got competitive scores, submit them. Still better to not submit than to send bad scores. It's better to not submit bad scores than it is to submit low scores if they if they give you the option of being test optional. And we've always said this on the podcast, take a look at who was test optional pre-pandemic and who went test optional because of the pandemic and take a look at their policy. And if they're doing this one year renewal, one renew, like, renewal, you should assume right now that they're gonna go back to testing if they're a highly selective school. And this also is going to increasingly include more flagship schools as well. And I can see that growing outside of the South. Right now, it's been the Southern flagships where you've seen it, Florida, Tennessee, Georgia, Texas. I can see that spreading. Not necessarily, I'm not sure if the Pacific Northwest, they seem pretty committed. But class of 2026, 20, you should not work off of the assumption that test scores will not be required. Having said that, time for grinding my gears, Julia. Yes. I'm doing a session with a Portland family I'm working with, and I told them I'm going to share this on Monday's podcast. So I got their permission. And by the way, this is a student who's testing extremely high. He's up in the 1500s, but he still wants to test again. You know, we all have those, Julia. 
I yes. want to go from the low 1500s to the high, right? So Yeah, I get it. I Some of my students describe it as the B plus, right? They're so close. And I'm like, gosh, I would see that as an A plus, but sure, go for it. <laughs> well, especially when you, you know, this student got his 1500s like, like early in the 10th grade. And a lot of times we do see kids from early in 10th to later in 11th, just without even any prep at all, go from like, you know, 1530 to 1580. Like that's something we see. So anyway, I think this is not the point. The student wants to go take the test. So what does the mom tell me? She told me something and made my blood boil. Now, before I, I share what it is, our regular listeners will know there was a time when I used to be directing people to Twitter quite a bit. Because I'm like, go to Twitter. I'm going to post on Twitter. I was going to use Twitter as an outlet to communicate a lot. And then i have so conflicted, Julia, because I have such a problem with Elon Musk. Yes. And like both Dave and Norm, my brother and, you know, my best friend Dave, the two of us, they, they have been all over my butt. Cancel your Twitter account like we did. And I'm such a believer in like, if you're not part of the problem, you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So I'm like really torn. I don't want to be supporting this guy. But yet I'm so much great information on education is on Twitter. Like people break stuff. So I haven't mentioned Twitter on here in a half a year, maybe longer, maybe a year. But I've kept my account, but I've been more of a lurker only. And I've just, you know, tapped into like this because a lot of really good stuff gets broken on Twitter. I'm talking about college college admissions news. But I broke my silence. I came out and I'm going to read a tweet that I posted a day ago. For all the schools returning to mandatory SAT, I just met with a Portland client. No August SAT centers are available in all of First, she said Northern California. Then it became all of California. Ugh. None in all of Oregon. One in Washington that is a seven-hour drive away. And then I put, what are we doing to families? Four exclamation marks. And then I closed by saying, inexcusable and indefensible. And if I had more characters because I ran out, I would have said, reprehensible. So is that what we're doing to families now? You got to hop a plane to go to some places because nothing, think about what that does for first gen under resourced families. And this is why I went off on that one episode because I talked about two sides of the coin. And when these decisions are only made by faculty who do their research, you have to also be listening to the other side of the coin, talking to counselors, talking to families to see what the ramifications of your decisions are. Because it's ridiculous that you're now asking a family basically to hop a plane or drive at least seven hours one way. And who knows if that's, if that was, it was one center in Washington and this was two days ago, that's probably full by now. So, so really, what are you supposed to do? Go spend hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars on airfare and hotels to take a test? That's what schools are doing that are going back to mandatory testing. And to me, it's unconscionable. So I just had to return another episode of Grinding My Gears. I haven't yes. done one in six months. <laughs> Hope you're okay it. with that, Julia. <laughs> oh, you know I'm okay with that. Stay mad. That's how I am. I'm almost like, if you notice, I didn't even say a word when the Stanford news came out because I'm just defeated at this point. Yeah, I'm just, yeah. and as my partner says, who I talk about a lot on the podcast, so he didn't, you know, he's from a low resource area. No one in his family except a couple folks went to college. And he's always telling me when I'm like, can you believe this is happening? He's like, yes. Because it just feels like this is further proof that this system was made not to work for certain people. You know, I, I just feel really strongly about this. Every college admission office, they need to, and I know some do, but not all do, they need to have like an advisory board that consists of like, you know, the counselors out there. They do have them. That's the yeah, best but part. They, <laughs> yeah, but they need to listen to what they're hearing, you know, and not just have it be ceremonial. They need to, they, because I find so many of them are in their ivory tower. I mean, I think you and I know that there's a lot of people that would be really uncomfortable with what I just said. If I said to them, so now you expect a family to 
to either drive a minimum of 14 hours round trip, and that's if that Washington one is still open. We know with so few open, we know how quickly that thing's going to fill up because there are willing people that can have the resources to hop a plane, grab a hotel, grab a rent a car, and drop two grand like it's nothing. Not everybody can do that. So that's really the position you're putting families in. By the way, I would say this to if you're from one of these regions, you might want to say something like this, you know, even in your additional information. And, and, you know, we got to be careful because you don't want to come across whining. You never want to give off a whining vibe. Uh, or maybe better yet, talk with your school counselor and have them phrase it if they're willing to write something. Um, there may be a way this could get implemented into an application. I have to be really careful giving general advice about that, you know, Julia, because, you know, you don't want to come off well as me and, you know, come off negative. But maybe I'm just trying to get the word out because I'm so darn mad. <laughs> all right. Spicy Julia, spicy stuck all in yes. one episode. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Friends, in part three, the final part of my interview with my friend John Hoffman, John talks about how Columbia's core curriculum helped him. I talk about why the open curriculum is appealing to me. John continues to share some more insights from his students and their experience, and I put them on the hot seat in our lightning round. Listen and enjoy. So, John, I I, I want you to talk to our listeners about the core curriculum at Columbia. Uh, we haven't talked about it very much. You've always, I've known you for 22, 23 years now, and you've always told me that you're a believer in core. Core gave you something that, you know, to this day sticks with you. Um, talk about what, what it was about Columbia's core that you found helpful. I think our listeners will find that interesting. Sure. Well, I mean, as you know, um, colleges have different distribution requirements. I, w- I would put colleges into four basic categories in terms of the um, amount of distribution requirements uh, that kids have to complete in order to graduate. And I think at Columbia, with the core, it probably is going to take a year and a half or two years to get through the core. Um, so it's going to be a, a big chunk of your Columbia undergraduate experience, very similar to the U of Chicago, which also has a very, very strong undergraduate core. Um, I am a great believer in the core because I think that at the end of four years of college, you want to come out being what I would call an educated person. So what does that mean? Obviously, you're going to have an area of strength. I mean, if you're graduating in engineering or if you're graduating in mathematics, if you're graduating in English or history or whatever you're going to be majoring in, you're going to basically have a lot of knowledge about that one area. Um, at the same time, I think it's important to be an, in order to be an educated person that when you graduate from college, you have knowledge in a number of areas. You have, you have knowledge in, in, in mathematics. You have knowledge in science. You become a proficient writer. Um, you, you know a foreign language. Um, you become knowledgeable about Western Civ um, and some of the great writers. And, and that's a big part of the core at Columbia uh, is you read a lot of the great writers um, and a lot of the great thinkers. Um, you, uh, you have to take courses in art um, whether it's art history or fine arts, you have to take courses in music, whether it's um, instrumental or you're taking courses in music history, music appreciation. Um, and I remember my dad saying to me once, it was very interesting because he was very happy that I, I started at Oberlin, I finished at Columbia. And he said, I'm really glad you're going to Columbia because of the core is he said to me, you know what? You cannot call yourself an educated person if after four years of college, you can't tell me who painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Okay, it's Michelangelo. But there are a lot of kids that can graduate four years of college and they have no idea who painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And it's probably the greatest work of art in the history of great works of art, you know? Um, So I I benefited greatly from the core because it forced me to take a a wide range of of classes, one of which was actually intensive um, composition 
At Columbia, you had to take a whole year of, of writing. I thought, well, I'm coming out of George school. I've had four years of a prep school education. I'm a good writer already. Instead of doing the whole year long writing course, I'll do the intensive one semester writing course. <laughs> well, Mark, I handed my first paper. I get it back the next day with a big F minus <laughs> in red, in red ink. F minus. F minus <laughs> and every other word and comma and exclamation point and everything was all read it out and inked up. So like, I'm like in total shock. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I was like a straight A student my last two years of prep school and I had a four O coming out of Oberlin going into Columbia and here my first paper back from Columbia. <laughs> I get, so I go to the professor and she's like, this is really bad. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I guess so. She put the minus after the F. <laughs> and I say, okay, do I have any chance of, of um, improving it? She goes, absolutely. This mm -hmm. is what I want you to do. I want you to rewrite it. Look at everything that I, that I put in there, and I want you to rewrite it and give it back to me as best as you can and include any of the comments that I, that I made. So I kind of went back and I rewrote the whole thing and I included all of her comments and then I handed it back in. The next one was, I think, a C minus. <laughs> You're improving. <laughs> and then I went back to her and I said, really? And she goes, well, this is English composition and we expect we have very high expectations and you're starting to get the point, but it needs a lot of work. And she said to me, look, every single word needs to be in the right place. The editing needs to be clean. It needs to be crisp. It needs to make sense. I want you to write it and rewrite it. She said, remember I talked to you about the rewrite? And I said, yeah, how many rewrites did you do? I said, I just did the one rewrite. That's what you told me to do. No, this next time, I want you to include all the stuff that I put in there. And then before handing it in to me, I want you to look at it from my eyes. Imagine that you are me. You're the professor. And look at it as an editor now and not as the creator. And I want you to do that and then do that five, six, seven more times. Wow. So I do that five, six, seven more times. I hand it in again. The next one was a B minus. He goes, you're starting to get it, John. You're starting to get it. <laughs> and I'm like, but this is painful. And she goes, well, you know, go back, go back to your high school and tell them they didn't do a good job with you. <laughs> You know, and I mean, it was embarrassing, but it was a total wake up call for me. And from that point forward, be, when it, before handing in any assignments, I would I would read and reread and edit and re-edit and rewrite multiple, multiple times until I felt it was as good as I could get it. And then I started getting some decent grades at Columbia, you know, <laughs> on, on my written work. So the core was wonderful. So I, I would put... U of Chicago and Columbia at level two in terms of core. Level three are most of your other colleges that have what they call distribution requirements, where you've got to take an art, you've got to take a humanity, you've got to take a science, you've got to take something math. But you, you know, for an art class, you could either do fine arts or you could do art history or, you know, but it wasn't as difficult as the core at either Chicago or Columbia. Level four, is what you have at places like Brown, Amherst, and Grinnell, where there are no requirements. And the attitude that they take is very interesting. They say, well, you know, our students are very mature and very responsible. And even though we are not going to tell them what they have to take, we trust our students. And most of them end up, when they graduate, they will have taken a whole wide, you know, range of classes in different areas, but we want to give them we want to empower them to make those choices, you know, and that it works for some people. And I'm sure there are a lot of kids going to Brown that never touch a math and they never touch a science and they may not touch an art and they may not touch a music class. You know, the kids that are going to be doing Brown engineering may not touch any of the humanities stuff. And the kids that are basically humanities kids may not touch any of the science stuff. And I don't really think that's very healthy. I really think you have to get a broadband now. So you, you heard me say that, um, Columbia and U of Chicago is level two. Can you guess, Mark, what's level one? Yeah, St. John's. There it is. You know your stuff, Mark. St. John's, both Annapolis and Santa Fe. I mean, you know, you got to read 200 books 
I was looking at it, the curriculum, because I just last week with a student of mine who I thought it could be a good match for, and we pulled up the freshman reading and went over it, and man, those books were deep, and the sophomore reading, and man, it was deep, but it attracts a certain kind of person who loves to read and discuss and write, and and it's a foundational education that can catapult people into lots of different careers. It's basically four years of intellectual history using only original sources. So at St. John's, when you're studying mathematics, you don't have a textbook. You're reading Euclid. I know. And, you know, obviously when you're, when you're doing philosophy, you're reading, you know, Sophocles and you're reading Aristotle and, uh, you know, but a lot of the stuff is original text. Um, but St. John's, you know, they have this curriculum where it, if you're going to end up going to law school, it's fine. If you're going to go to business school, it's fine. But if you're going to go to med school, you actually have to spend a whole year somewhere doing the, the year of bio, the year of chem, the year of physics, the year of calculus, and the year of organic chem. It may even take more than a year. St. John's will not if you were, this is a true story. There was a young man who enrolled for one term at St. John's and had to leave because his family was moving to California. So he enrolled at Stanford and he became like a classics major at Stanford. And he took a lot of the same courses and read a lot of the same materials at Stanford that he would have done at St. John's. And then he decided he wanted to graduate from St. John's as long as St. John's would give him credits from Stanford. Can you guess the result of this student's efforts to transfer his credits from Stanford to St. John's? <laughs> no. No, they would not accept one of his courses. They all have to be done at St. John's College. I mean, they're purists, Mark. They're, they're, they're purists. You know, it's interesting. And I want you to talk about this because uh, I, I respect CORE highly. But I'm going to be honest, I was, I'm a person who had been very drawn to an open curriculum. You mentioned some of the schools. You mentioned Grinnell and, and, uh, and, Brown Brown and, Amherst. and Amherst. It's also yep. Vassar. It's, West, it's Wellesley. It's Smith College. And then on the, on the university side, Rochester allows way more freedom than any other university. But Rochester and Brown. Because um, I'm someone that loves, if I love something, I'm going to be all in. And I love the intellectual energy of being in a classroom with people who had to take that class or didn't have, who are only there because they want to take, you know, probably the best class I ever took in college was, was called the ghetto. And it looked at the ghetto from how ghettos are formed, maintained, and, you know, comes at it from an economic standpoint, from a political standpoint, from an anthropological standpoint, from all different standpoints. It was fascinating. And I'd love the intellectual fusion to be able to be in there with people who want to be there. Yeah. But there's something to be said for the well-roundedness of core that I respect. I'm an open curriculum person. Let me study what I love to study and I'm going to be all in. You know, certainly I certainly work with some students that have real strong aversions to math or to foreign language or certain things uh, who are drawn to that. So it's interesting how America we have so many. I think it's great that we have choices. Yeah. You know, you know, my son went to Brandeis and uh, they have, um, you know, a number of distribution requirements, uh, one of which has to be, um, you know, Josh, my son, Josh would have had to take a course either in art or in music. And he was like, Dad, I can't sing, so I can't I can't do any of the music stuff. I don't want to do music history. I can't draw. So I don't want to do I don't want to do that. Um so he started looking at art history courses, you know, because that would have satisfied the, the art requirement. And he's like, but I'm not really interested in, 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 in art history. I said, well, let, you know, let, let's go through the curriculum. Let, let's. So he found a course which was called Art of the Vatican that was taught by this incredibly distinguished world-class professor at Brandeis who also on Rate My Professor – had a 100% student favorable rating. So I said to Josh, you know, Josh, this course looks like it's going to be as much history 
as it is art. Because when you think about the art of the Vatican, how did the Vatican get a lot of its art? A lot of it was stolen, you know, and brought to the Vatican over time, you know, and, and what was the history going on at the time? And what were the wars and, and what was happening in these different places? And, and who took the art and how did it get to the Vatican? He ended up telling me that it was probably one of the best courses he took at Brandeis. And the summer after he took the course, we were in Europe. He insisted on going to Italy. So he'd go to the Vatican, into the catacombs, and look at some of the artwork that he had studied in this course. So if that isn't a good example as to why you should go to a school that has some kind of distribution requirement, I don't know what is. Well, most schools do, John, too. Like when you take that year one, two, three, four and break it down. Right. Like the overwhelming lion's share fall in distribution requirements, yes. right? Most so of them most, are, most of them are threes. Yeah. yeah, and most are threes. And most distribution requirements really give kids a lot of flexibility. Right. You might you might have fifty courses that you can pick from, and normally you can find something in there that uh, even even for the people with strong whatever math or language aversions, you know, can usually find something that can work for them or whatever other science aversion or whatever else you have. Um, right. What's your advice to counselors about how to handle conversations with students or parents if maybe they don't understand how selective it is or how much things have changed or they have a a top top heavy list any any thoughts sure i um and, and this harkens back to my days when I was a high school placement counselor at De La Salle Academy. Um, and I would say like you, we were pretty good at what we did. And I have a pretty good sense in looking at a young person's academic and testing and overall gestalt portfolio, pretty good sense how, how competitive they would be at, at, at a certain set of schools. And from time to time, I would get a parent who would basically come into my office, plop down in the chair and say, Here's my list. These are the schools that I want my child to apply to and ultimately go to. That's my list. And I would look at the list and I would look at their academic profile and I would know immediately that the student wasn't going to get into any of the colleges on the parent's list. So I then asked the parent a question. I would say, I'm going to ask you a question, and you can only select door number one or door number two. You can't have both. You can only select one. Here's the question. My job is to help you develop a list of colleges that make sense for you and this process and your child. And Okay? So here's my question. Do you want to be happy with this process and this list when you walk out of my door, out of my office today? Or do you want to be happy at the end of the process when those letters of admission and wait list and deny come in? Because if you want to be happy at the end of the process, you're going to have to change your list. But if you only want to leave my office with the same list that you came in with, then understand that your child is going to receive five or 10 denial letters at the end of this process, and you will have to own the blame because I won't own it because I tried to counsel you. I tried to be rational. I tried to show you that based on what your child is bringing to this process, the list that you have assembled is just not going to work. So door number one or door number two. And it generally worked. John, you've listened to our podcast. You know, every first time listener goes on the hot seat with some non-academic, non-college counseling questions. So besides playing tennis, how else do you relax and unwind? Well, we have a um, 16-month-old pug named Mochi, who we love and adore, become a member of our family. And uh, we take her everywhere and we walk her everywhere. And uh, she's just a delight to be around. As I tell my friends who ask me, uh, because I was very, very allergic to mochi um, in the first six months. I, I was really sick to the point where 
I almost had to go to the hospital um, because I was allergic. To, I didn't realize I was allergic to dogs. And luckily, my doctor prescribed something that uh, worked for me. And my friend said, John, was it worth it? Was it worth it almost having to go to the ER to keep the dog? And I said to them, on my worst day, on my wife's worst day, and on the worst day of my two kids, my dog always gives me her best day. There you go. So, so I'm very, I'm very happy with that. Um, I, um, I enjoy skiing as well um, as playing tennis. I love reading. Uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm an insatiable reader. And you're a movie buff. You're always quoting detailed descriptions from movies. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I love going to the movies. I just saw a horrible movie. Uh, I recommend that no one sees it. <laughs> uh, called, called Challengers, which is about tennis, actually. Okay. Uh, and it's actually nothing about tennis. So uh, if you were thinking, if you're a tennis fan and you were thinking of going to the movie, I recommend that you not go. Um, but I, I just recommend, you know, uh, living life to the fullest and being a person of character and making decisions that feel right for you. Uh, don't do things that other people feel you should do. Do things that you really want to do. Let your children live their own lives and let them become their own true selves and do what you can to help them in that path and just be the best person that you can. Um, I guess that's the best I can offer. And John, tell us, uh, give us a movie and a book that uh, either your favorite movie or a movie that you you know, um, has impacted you in a book that you feel uh, our listeners would be served well to, to read? Well, I would say the book that probably had the greatest impact on me was Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, uh, which is a powerful novel about a man trying to make a choice, trying to make a, making a decision that seemed logical at the time but realizing that the decision itself was immoral and the guilt that ended up coming from making that decision, horrible decision, ended up consuming him um, until the point that he had to own the decision uh, to become a better person and to free himself of, of that heinous crime that he committed. Um, that was a really, really powerful story about human nature. Very similar to a book like uh, Lord of the Flies by William Golding or many of Shakespeare's plays. Uh, in terms of a movie, um, I love Dr. Zhivago. I thought that was one of the most wonderful movies I've ever seen. And I never tire from seeing it because the ending is very bittersweet. You know, most movies, even if they're powerfully negative through 90% of them, they end uh, on a positive note where the sun comes out and good things happen and, 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 you're, and you, leave, you leave the theater feeling good and uh, uplifting. Dr. Zhivago is not that way, um, but it's a wonderful story. So that would, be, that would be the movie that I would recommend and the book that I would recommend. John, this has been awesome. And uh, I just want to thank you for your 45 years of service um, in giving back to kids. I know how passionate you are, especially for helping um, under-resourced students that aren't born on third base. And, um, you know, you've just been a tireless advocate ever since I've known you and almost every conversation that we have. And thanks for sharing some of your wisdom with our listeners today. I appreciate you, man. And Mark, thank you for helping me with my process and being there for me as I went through this with my daughter, which was more difficult and more painful than anything I've ever gone through. <laughs> and here, I, here I've here i been doing this with 1,800 kids through my four decades, and I, I, I never had any kind of level of anxiety with this, but with my own kid. It, it, it was it was it was difficult. Even with all the experience that I've had, it was a really difficult process to go through. And I can understand how parents um, have a difficult time with the process. But you have to let it free you. you. You have to let your kid own the process, drive the process, support them in their process, be happy for their successes. Don't dwell on the denies. 
Nobody gets in everywhere. And everyone will end up at the right college for them and they will embrace it and do well. So, I mean, I think that's the best best message to come from this. Well, and I thank you for listening because you could have said, hey, I've been doing this for decades, like back off. But I felt like uh, even that, uh, you know, you've got 10 years on me. I felt like you you listened and, and we had some tough conversations. And at the end of the day, you know, everything worked out well and you're you're happy with everything. So I give you credit for for being willing to listen. And, you know, the interesting thing, John's got two kids. We only talked about one today because he's fresh off going through this process and just made a decision um, just, well, within the last week, John. Um, you know, last, where, three, last three days. Yeah, the last three days, you know, where your youngest will be going. But, but I walked you through this with your son uh, what, six years ago. Are they about six years apart? With Josh, eight yeah. years apart. Eight Josh. years, yeah. Yeah. Josh went through the whole process. He also went to George School, and he ended up at Brandeis, and he loved it. He had a great experience, majored in history, minored in medieval and Renaissance studies and classics, graduated magna cum laude, and he ended up going to um, the NYU Steinhardt School of Education to get his master's, uh, which he did while uh, doing having a full-time job in the Danbury public school system. Uh, so that was a pretty stressful time for him, but thankfully he's a really good student. Um, so he was able to manage the two processes and get through it. So yeah, it's it's been it's been fun going through this with your children, but also it's really important to let them take the lead. You know, when Maya and Josh and I started on the college process, Mark, uh, I said to them, when we get to the college. You know, you're going to be the one that goes in the front door and you're going to register. I'm not going to register you. When we go in for the info session, you're going to sit in the front. I'm going to sit in the back. When we go on the tour, you're going to be the first one up front next to the person giving the tour so you can ask questions. I'm going to be in the back. I wanted to demonstrate truthfully that even though I've been in this space, that this is their process and they had to own it. And I totally backed off. And let my kid do everything. So um, I think they appreciated that, um, especially after the first the first couple schools after we visited a college. Both kids would say, "Well, what do you think, Dad?" I'm like, "No, it's irrelevant what I think. The important thing is what do you think." I'm not going to be going. You're going to be going. So after the few, first few colleges, they got the fact that I was going to back off. And I was going to take a back seat. And as I described to them as I'm the chauffeur, that's my role. You can't drive yet. So I'll drive you there. We get there. It's your show. I'll drive you home afterwards. Um, and if you want to talk to me, I'll listen, but I'm not going to give an opinion because the only opinion that matters is yours. And I think it's wrong for parents to give their opinion, to tell kids what they should be thinking because you emasculate your children and you take away the joy of this process, the joy of discovery that should be theirs. It's wrong. And I've seen so many parents do this and it is so wrong. And I'm sure when you have your conversations with parents that you're having these conversations as well. And hopefully some of them are learning and some of them take it to heart. It's hard because parent, you know, I mean, you said it yourself and look how many times you've been through this. Like when you're a parent and it's your own kid, your own flesh and blood um, and you want what's best for them. And it's a mixture of you wanting what's best for them. Maybe you have some ego in there and it's all entangled and all mixed up together. And, um, you know, and if you've bought into the mindset that where your kid goes to college is an indictment on your parenting, if that's if you've been your orientation, then that's going to be how you're going to think. It's like because the liberation actually needs to happen before your kid is a senior. What when decisions are about to come out, you can't just flip a switch. Then you need to have been in a position of making that liberation, and you know, long before that, in order to for it to be successful. But um, um, thanks again, John. This has been great, and uh, I'm sure you and I will talk later in the week as we we often do. And I appreciate you, man. I loved it, Mark. Uh, and you can have me back at any time. This was a lot of fun. Take care. All right. All right. Well. Thank you, Mark. On Thursday's episode, Julie and I will answer a question from a student who has a question about a book award he received. 
And then Susan and I will answer a question from a mom who wants to know how colleges perceive it when a student does three years of high school instead of four. Lisa has the final part of her interview with Michelle McEnany on the topic, how to maximize your campus tour experience, some do's and some don'ts for your campus visit. And we have a brand new spotlight. Linda interviewed Tara Williams, and Tara's the dean of Barrett Honors College. It's our first ever interview on an honors college. And Linda picked one of the honors colleges that is the most comprehensive and the most well-resourced. So, yeah, so it's great. You'll get Susan, you'll get Julia, you'll get Linda, you'll get Lisa, all four of us on Thursday's episode. Friends, I was thinking the other day, what would I think, what would you think if I'm on the way to the mall, you're on the way to the mall, and your best friend said, hey, can you pick me up a pair of shoes? I'll pay you back. So you respond to your friend and you say, well, what kind of shoes do you want? And your friend says, just get me whatever is the most expensive pair. When you look at them kind of strange, like they got two left shoes, wouldn't you think you want the most expensive pair of shoes? Don't you care how well the shoe fits your foot? Don't you need to put the shoe on your own foot to try it out? Just because it's expensive, that doesn't mean it's a good fit for your foot. Well, friends, college is the same way. And friends, your job is to find the shoe that fits your foot the best, not someone else's foot. Your job is to find the college that's the best fit for your student, not the best fit for somebody else's student. Just like there's no such thing as best shoe, there's no such thing as best college. There's only best college match. It's a bunch of twaddle. That's why the rankings are a bunch of twaddle. There's no such thing as best college. There's only best college match. See you on Thursday, friends. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Matvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stylianos Dimitriou. And if you want to have a coaching session with Lisa, Linda, or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is your collegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.